I was today years old when I finally found out how to pronounce George Max's name, because that's <laughs> not the way you say it. It's Moxie, right? But I have to let you know, the, 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 the CEO of the first team of Silicon Valley, if you see M-A-X-E, right? Everybody, you realize, you go into things knowing people Absolutely. are going to mispronounce your name. You know, so it's like, okay. That's I, been going on my whole life, Gary. Oh, man. Well, I'm glad I finally, because I, I have no shame. So I asked George, because I've known George for a while, and I've never asked him, how do you pronounce your name? And he finally goes, I said, is it this way or that way? He goes, <laughs> neither. You know, and he was too kind to go, you dolt. He didn't put that part in. <laughs> first day of Silicon Valley, how do you, and the CEO of First Day, how do oh, you get goodness. there? It's a job that I never ever would have thought that I would have had when I was a kid. Um, I always wanted to be an architect. Um, so it's a very circuitous route to get to this job. At least it was for me. Um, it's take, It probably took, what, 30 years to get there? When you think about it. Uh, and I brought you know, all kinds of different backgrounds, education, work experience, etc. Uh, to the to the table, but uh, it was never something that I really expected uh, or was looking for. But if I were to narrow it down, Gary, to the, the few things that probably pointed me to the job, one was actually uh, the death of my father, who was an avid golfer. Really? Um, I had coached baseball a number of years with some friends and stopped at one point and my father had passed away and I thought, you know, I've got to pick up some activity. And so I picked up golf. And so I started to, you know, fiddle around with that and get a little bit better, not good, but a little bit better and started to hear about the first tee. And I was a management consultant and I thought, you know what? I'm curious about this organization. Maybe I'll try to start one in Berkeley. I lived in Berkeley for about 30 years after Cal. And somebody was already trying to create First Tee of East Bay or Oakland. And then I found out about the San Jose job and thought, huh, I'll apply. I'll just see what happens. And here I am 15 years later. Wow. Wow. And an architect. So you're always kind of good at math. Math, you speak. Do you speak math? And I say that I, I have an I have an ex-wife who's a molecular bio biogeneticist, right? So I I put her through Cal Berkeley. <laughs> That's what I did, and I remember helping her study for math. And and I would like I would ask her these equations, and then she would spout on about what they yes. were flashcards, right? And 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 she and I'm like, how do you even? And she goes, well, it's all chain reacted. You know, if I know this happens, then I know this happens. And if this theorem comes into effect, now I know this theorem. And I know this, you know, and extrapolate. And I'm like, it's a language. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I speak yeah, math. Yeah, I would definitely speak math. But I don't speak science. So I have chemistry, biology, all of that. No, never had an interest, never had a, a real aptitude for it. Math, yes. Numbers, definitely. But, you know, I always laugh because I'll never forget the first day of business school in economics. You know, hotshot professor, almost, you know, Nobel laureate kind of guy at the chalkboard when I saw him draw a differential equation. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. How is calculus going to be in economics? And next thing you know, we were doing calculus and econ. And I thought math was behind me at that point. But I was never high level math, but I'm absolutely a math guy. I definitely think in numbers. It's very easy for me. I don't. When I, my, I have young sites, I have an 11 to 13 year old. And uh, when I, when it gets to the math section, <laughs> I mean, Thank gosh for these things. So I can actually, how do I, you know, how do I do that? Or my wife, I always, always have to ask it. That's a mom question, right? You want to do history? You want to do English? You want to do anything? Mom does math. I, I do not speak. I do not speak it. Uh, but science, it, it leads me, I, I, because, you know, with first year of Polygon Valley, I'll tell you my favorite person I ever met on a golf course. So I'm playing 
Sunnyvale Municipal, which if you're not from the area, it's just, it's a nice little course and it's a little middle of nowhere and it's right where Moffat Field and your planes fly over and stuff. And I'm out there and I'm playing with this old man in overalls. He's wearing overalls and a flannel nice. shirt. Nice, you could have been in Alabama, Gary. Yeah, I could have been, right? And I start talking to him because I love the social aspect of the game. I mean, I'm not good enough to try to hone in on, let's shoot a great score today. I love the social aspect of the game. And uh, I start talking to him and I'm like, so are you retired? He goes, yeah. And I said, where did you retire from? And he's just not, you know, he's just mm -hmm. like, he's a sweet man. And he goes, I worked at NASA. And I said, oh, what, what did you do at NASA? He goes, I was on Warner Von Braun's team. And if you know anything about the space program, Warner Von Braun, was the guy we 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 adopted a Nazi? Sorry, historians, right. but it's true. We adopted a Nazi Nazi to get us ahead in the space race, and uh, and to hear, I got to spend four hours hearing the inside of NASA, and hearing the stories that I had never heard because I've been a space geek my entire life, and I think I probably fell in love with golf more that day than I ever had in my entire life. When I when it truly showed me what it can do. Because there's no other way I would have ever talked to anybody who worked on Ryder right. Von Braun's team. I love it. Well, that's one of the great things about golf is, you know, we're using it as a, as a vehicle for character development within First Tee. But golf is so social. It's so internal. Um, you know, we have our own challenges and and whatnot in playing the game and it, you never stop learning but it's also so social it's really a, a, so much about the people who you play with if you're not jumping in on the social side you're missing to me unless you are a competitive golfer i mean if you're trying to make your living playing golf that's a different and to be honest, I think that sounds like the worst way to live, make a living there is. You don't ever see a lot of happy professional golfers. You know, it's not like a team sport. It's you don't cut it, you don't make it. And, oh, three strokes means the difference between a great week and a horrible week. Uh, and and it just so I, I have such an admiration for the professional golfers as far as what they do. But for the rest of us hacks, and let's be clear, if you're making a living at golf, you're a hack. I don't care if you're a plus two. If you're not making a living, you're a hat. Just love it. Love it and go with it. And you don't, and you're not all in on the social aspect. Put the damn clubs away and walk away. Just right. be done. I one of my favorite things you mentioned, you know, favorite person to meet that you met on the golf course uh at Sunnyvale Muni. One of my favorite things to do was to was to just walk up at Tilden Park Golf Course in Berkeley. And I played there many times over the years. I consider it my my home course, but it's just fascinating who you meet. I mean, everything, everybody from soup to nuts, A to Z, it's great. Yeah, well, we, I took my son out to play uh, a few weeks ago. We're over at Santa Teresa, and I watched the guy, we're, we're, I, the guy behind us, and there's a hole where you're going down the hole and they're coming up, right? It's a par three. And I looked over and I told my son, we're driving down. It's like, see that guy right there? And he goes, yeah. I said, his name is Dave Rigetti. Probably one of the best relief pitchers ever. Played for the Yankees, played for the Giants. Won World Series. And my son, who's 13, was like, really? What's he doing here? I'm like, I got no idea. He's playing golf with his buddies. That's what he's doing. You know? And then, yeah, that was just an average day on yes. a mini course. That there's there's Dave Brigetti yes, right there. Absolutely. Well, and you know, one of the things that's fascinating within First T is that we have kids who they would never dream. It doesn't even cross their minds or their families' minds that golf would ever be an activity for them. And that's part of what we're all about is to is to help address that and make sure they feel a sense of belonging and have affordable access to the game. Because otherwise, this great thing that you and I enjoy is, is something that they would never even touch. And then it opens up so many doors because of the people you meet. I, and that's the thing. I love the first thing, and I try to do as much stuff with you guys as I can. And I, I love it for that aspect. I want more kids. I wish there'd have been a first team 
when I was a kid. I wish I would have been able to be introduced to the game. Uh, I wish, especially growing up in rural Alabama, I wish there would have been more avenues from, for minorities because there, there, were, there wasn't any avenue for a, for a poor white kid in South Alabama in the 60s and 70s. I was still 100 miles mm-hmm. ahead of a poor black mm-hmm. kid. You know, and I love how we are trying our best for this game that we love, that we're going, no, no, kids, come on in, come on in and play. And you're seeing some of these courses that let kids play for free. Yes. Yes. Some of the, it, for for the kids in our realm, first tee realm, um, and then kids in Northern California, golf is, it can be very affordable. Very affordable. But, you know, I, I even, in my experience, I, it sounds like I had a completely different socioeconomic upbringing. I grew up in a, a pretty high-rent district in L.A. Uh, my, uh-huh. Believe me, my eyes opened pretty wide when I got to Berkeley and saw, you know, was in much, a much more diverse environment. But I wish I had had the first T2. And I wish it had been like what we're doing here, which is to make sure that the kids are pretty balanced in terms of 50% being lower income, 50% being average to high income. Because then you have everybody together okay. learning from each other. And I wish I had that. Yeah, and, and, and getting a chance to mix with each other and, and having, understand, having, having the kids understand each other's experiences, right? Because, uh, you know, I'm not playing the woe is me card. I'm just not. I'm just throwing the same thing at it. But coming from desperate poverty, I had no expectations put on myself. You, coming from uh, the high-end district, you grew up mm-hmm. with expectations. You know, mom and dad were like, hey, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. Those are two different ways to grow up. And each have their own toughness and their own rewards, right? Because I grew up without, hey, anything I, if I don't end up in prison, I'm going to be considered right. pretty much a success. Right. Whereas you, different, yeah, totally, the word totally thing. I put, that we always think of is agency. I grew up, I just assumed that I would have agency over my life, that I have, I can chart my own course. I can make my own decisions. I can go anywhere. I could apply myself and achieve anything that I wanted. But a lot of kids, sounds like your background, um, and a lot of the kids that we, we see in First Tee, they don't think that way. So we really work hard to help them think that way. And I love we're teaching them a game that they can mm-hmm. play for the rest of their life. And they can play with any skill level. I can't play basketball. I can't play basketball with my 13-year-old anymore, much less Steph Curry, right? Because the skill levels are so different. But you could play golf theoretically with Justin Thomas. Now, you're not going to match his score, but you could still have fun playing with Jordan Speed, right? Because you're both experiencing yeah, the well, golf And that's course. the whole handicapping index system is to make it so that People who are basically starting at an an, an unequal uh, starting point could actually compete against each other. And it really ends up being whoever is playing their better golf that day. Yeah. Well, Jordan Spieth would have to give me, I don't know, 35 <laughs> shots aside. Uh, <laughs> and let me play from the 150 marker. You know, not even the tees. Just let me just go tee off from the 150 like- marker right there. So that, who's, who's been fun that you've met on the golf course? That you've got a chance to actually play golf Oh, my golf gosh. With? Well, the, I probably have the most fun with my buddies when I play. Yeah. Well, that's where the most fun is, but the most impressive that you've got a chance well, to play Well, somebody out. who I played uh, in the Positive Coaching Alliance tournament with, uh, may, when was it? Maybe six months ago. And it was, what they did is they had foursomes for donors and key people in their annual tournament. And then you'd have a celebrity player. And my group got to play with Conrad Ray, who's the men's golf coach at Stanford. 
uh, and played on the team with Ty- at Stanford with Tiger and Nota Begay, et cetera. And if you've ever met Conrad, he's one of the nicest people on the planet. He's just a great, great guy. And we had such a wonderful time. But you and I, if you were in the group, we'd, we'd hit the ball, you know, 200 yards down the fairway on a dog leg right. And Conrad would tee it up and go over the, the dog leg, <laughs> over the tree. And it was yeah. just insane to watch what he could do. Now, he also has played that course for what? Probably 20 years. But it was just amazing to see what he could do and the way he could pick apart that golf course with his skills. I, I love playing with good players. We're going to come back and talk more about first team of Silicon Valley and how you can get involved too with George Excellent. Moxie. I am so excited to be working with the Nugent Family Counseling Center founded by Dr. Jeff Nugent. They have three office locations in San Jose, Santa Clara, and Reno, Nevada. What they do is support a diverse community of children, adolescents, adults, and families who are affected by conditions such as addiction, depression, anxiety, trauma, stress, and grief. They strive to provide clients with the tools needed to understand and acknowledge the effects that their emotions and behaviors have on themselves and their personal relationships. As Dr. Nugent told me, We try to help our clients fix what's wrong. They don't want you coming forever. They want to help you get past this problem. And they also remind families what they love about each other and utilize a combination of individual, family, and couples therapy. They can help you no matter what you're facing. You do not have to go through this alone. Check out NugentTherapy.com. NugentTherapy.com. You can do this and they can help. So I, I love playing with good players. I, and cause I don't have a competitive bone in my body, right? I really don't. I'm there to play my game. And if you beat me by 30 strokes, and if anything, I enjoy watching really good players because it, I, I'm assuming that most people who are listening to the podcast and watching the podcast on this episode are golf nerds. Welcome, my people. Welcome. And and there's something about watching because this game is so stinking hard. And watching someone try to hit a shot that they see in their head mm-hmm. before they hit it is remarkable. So what are you thinking when you see a great, great shot? How do they do that? Or I I I wonder my thing is 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 I think they have an ability. That is God given. I remember I, I played golf with uh, uh, oh, what's his name? I'm blanking it now. Uh, he was on the PGA and now he does commentary. Uh, it's John, and he won one tournament, yeah, and I can't Roger remember. Malpe. Uh, not Roger. It's it. No, not Roger Malpe. It's John, and I. It, I'm spacing it right now, but he does stuff on Sirius XM, and and he was famous because I think his caddy had a heart attack during a round one time. But uh, but he was telling me, we're playing golf, and he goes, I've always, first time my dad took me here, took me to a golf course, I was about seven or eight years old. And within 20 balls, I had figured out how to hit a pitching wedge 50 yards. It, it, because it's just something, whatever it is, I knew how to do it, right? And he goes, and then when you when you add in the drive, that I want to get better and better and better. Plus you have the skills. And so I sit back and I wonder what their swing feels like as compared to what Mm. I feel during my swing, which is a controlled seat. And you know, I'm often uh, praying as I hit the ball. (laughs) Was that a quick, did they say a quick prayer or no prayer? What did they do? Yeah, mine is, please don't let me kill anybody. Please just, that's all I'm after. Don't, don't let me hit this ball, hit somebody well, and, You know, when I, when I first took, this, took on this job, uh, I had played pr- pretty much recreational golf, a little bit with my father, who was a dentist. And, uh, but, you know, I wasn't that interested in it um, when I was a kid. But then, I, as I mentioned, at Tilden Park, I played for years. And... I thought that I was pretty good. And then I came here and I realized how competitive the people around uh, could be. And then I started to play with people who were really good. 
And as an athlete, having played baseball and football, I'd come across people, I'm not saying they didn't look athletic, they just didn't look like a baseball player or a football player to me. And I couldn't wrap my mind around how they could be better than me. And what's especially humbling are the girls, are the women. Because especially the girls in our program, the young women on our program, because they're so good. And it seems to come naturally. You know, women's sport in the last 10 years, all levels of everything have gotten better. I'll be frank about it. Watching college basketball, women's basketball 10 years ago, 15 years ago was brutal. I mean, it was like watching a junior high game. You know, it was just brutal. And now to watch those women in golf, in basketball, in soccer, it is amazing what has happened once we truly opened up the field for them and gave them the same mm-hmm. access that, that, that men have had. It, to watch the level of play in all women's sports go up is nothing short of miraculous. Yes, and in this world of character development that the first he is in, mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of women, but also girls, but adult women who described the first time they played with men and beat them and what it did for their self-esteem and their confidence. Because they were so often, un- and then they f- found over the years, they're so often underestimated, and then they just crush the guys. I love it. <laughs> I, I love it because, like I said, I'm not competitive. So I've played with young women who just mop the floor with me, and I have enjoyed mm-hmm. every second of it uh, because I love watching kids with skill levels. Right, jump it up and and doing stuff like that. Uh, you talked about playing with a golf coach. I was playing Moffat Field one day, me and my buddy, and we got we got pl- paired with this old dude. It's an old dude, and he had hit a hundred and ten yard drive, and he'd go up and he'd take his fairway wood and he'd hit it about ten yards off the green, a dead straight, and then he would chip it up. And I'm not I'm not even being facetious. He probably chipped Love in it four times that day. Four, four times three. And, you know, and finally about a whole 13, 12 or 13, I'm like, uh, what are you doing? He goes, I'm retired. I said, what did you do? He goes, I was the women's golf coach at San Jose <laughs> State. And I'm like, and I'm looking at him and I'm like, during the Julie Inkster, Patty Sheehan days. And he goes, yeah. Oh, wow. And again, I got to hear all the stories. I got to hear these wonderful stories about these legendary Hall of Fame golfers. And and one of the stories I said, I said, did you ever play them? He goes, no. He goes, I did not want them to think they could beat me. He goes, now I would do games with them where I would play putting games and chipping games. He goes, but I get, I goes, could you, could, have beat, could you have beat them? And he goes, I have no idea. I don't think so. I said, but I have no idea. He goes, but we weren't ever going to have that because I was going to be their coach. And they needed that respect from me. Not only for me, they needed it from me, right? To sit back and go, let's just work on your game and not worry about mine. I like it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was so fascinating. I've had so fun. You talk about looking like golfers. I don't know if you know who Colt Ford is. Colt Ford is uh, basically a country rapper, you know, and he played a little bit on a, on a, on a, on a, a uh, one of the Nike tours or something like that. He played college golf. Colt's about five foot three, <laughs> five, four. And even though he's lost weight back in the day, he was probably tipping the scales at 260 at 5'4", right? And so he was a short, little, lumpy man. And he used to play golf all the time with Jake Owen. Don't know if you know who Jake Owen is. Country singer, played Florida State, good looking. He looks like what a professional golfer should be. He's won the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, right? And he goes, uh, it just ticks Jay off. Jake off because he can't beat Colt. And Colt told him, he goes, you know, why is it this gets you so mad? And Jake goes, listen, somebody who looks like you shouldn't be beating somebody who looks like me. (laughs) I completely relate. 
I completely relate. <laughs> and, and it's it's a kind of an arrogance. It's a kind of a I don't know what it is, but I completely relate. <laughs> It is, and it's just so much fun. That's the thing about, I mean, we could sit here and tell golf stories, or will, because I'm going to have you back. But that's the fun thing we do is is that's the social aspect, right? I could sit here, I could literally tell you 90 minutes worth of golf stories right now. I, I mean, I could just, because you accumulate them, and I love them, and I savor them, and I hold on to them. And, and I love sharing them with people. And I always sit back, I have this weird job and I've had a chance to play golf with a lot of different people and they're big names. And it sounds like I'm a name dropper and I absolutely am, but I'm doing it because it's going to be fun for all of us. And we're all going to have this. And I want all of these kids to have that. You're going to have fun. You're going to have your best friends and you're never going to laugh harder on a golf course than you do with your best friends. And if you don't have best friends who give you hell when you top a shot, <laughs> find new ones. <laughs> <laughs> or or when you hit a good shot, I love to say, oh, that, that was all right. <laughs> <laughs> my my group of guys that we play with, we uh one guy was I saw about I was out playing by myself one day and I came up on the guy who was playing in front of me. And he was a sweet older Indian man. And we played, and he goes, well, I play out here all the time. We just play. And we started playing again. He became part of our group, right? So we have played years with this wonderfully sweet older. And to watch him turn into a trash talker has been one of the delights of my <laughs> entire life. I love it. Let's talk about the inevitable. End of life. Once I leave this earth, I can't do anything for my loved ones. But I've just learned by pre-planning a funeral or cemetery in advance takes the guesswork out when death occurs suddenly and your mind is clouded with grief. Dignity Memorial can help. My friend Tina Scurla pre-plans funeral and cemetery arrangements so loved ones don't have to. They're North America's largest provider of funeral, cremation, and cemetery services. They're dedicated to getting every detail right, and they do that by listening to you. I know it's a hard subject, but I also know we all see the sense and value of what Dignity Memorial does. Does. Use the promo code Gary to get 25% off at Willow Glen Funeral Home. Reach out to my friend Tina Skirla today. She's committed to helping families not go through the tragedy of loss alone. Click on the link, use the promo code Gary, or email her at dmppa tina skurla s k u r l a dot com, or call 408 398 7050. That's the thing I told you the joy of my life is watching this older Indian man turn into a trash talker, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he'll do that. You know, you hit a bad shot and he'll look at me and he goes, Gary, did you mean to do that? <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and and it, one of the things that I love about my work, and you asked me earlier about how did I get into this? I've also been coaching and mentoring so much over the years. And if I think of my father as my, my childhood mentor. Um, but it's just so interesting, the different types of kids that you meet and people that you meet. Most of my direct coaching or mentoring is my staff. I have 10 full-time staff and we've got about 25 instructors. And many are in their 20s. They're coming right, they're in college or coming right out of college. So that's where a lot of my direct mentoring is taking place. Um, I wrote a, my master's thesis on mentoring. And one of the things that I said in it was that there's an art to it. You can't pull the art out of it. And there's something magical that happens when two people click. So you're mentioning this gentleman and how you kind of, you get this joy out of his trash talking and you've clicked uh -huh. in a certain way. And it's interesting you say that because that's one of the indications that I've had over the years that I'm clicking with somebody is the way they will tease me. And it doesn't matter that I'm a person of authority and they know how to do it. Respect. My, my best friend, we met on a golf course, never met him before. He had, he had gotten our group and we're, we're playing on the first hole. He tops it. He tops it and hits it 20 yards. And I looked, I looked, you know, nobody knows what to say because we don't know him. And I'm this guy. I said, well, <laughs> at least it went straight. <laughs> and he turns around and starts laughing. And I look and I said, 
me and him are going to be friends. Absolutely. And then he turns around, puts another balls down, hits it about 290 on a rope. Right. And, but he was a good player just, and, 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 and ever since then we have been there. And I can tell you this, I have had more honest, life changing conversations on a golf course. I have been more honest with my male friends where you really truly do go, here is who I am, works it all on a golf course than I have at church, in business, in my house by a huge margin. Well, and you mentioned church. It is a very holy experience. So it's good that you're sharing and maybe confessing a little bit out there on the golf course because it is holy, like I say. <laughs> well, and it's and it's that shared experience, right? And you have fun and you start you start showing each other who you are and you laugh. And, and it's like, uh, you know, because I don't have a handicap, don't love ones. I tell my friends, listen, rules are suggestions. That's all they are. <laughs> so if I, I don't, you know, I'm going to put my ball sometimes where I think it should have ended up, not where it did end up, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that same club. <laughs> but that's just how I play, because I'm not going to win a tournament. I fall like a deck chair. If there was, we could put a bucket of warm sweat spit on the line for a putt and I would fold. No, no, I can't. I just can't. Uh, so I, I know better than that, but it's, it's just so much fun. And, and the stuff that you're doing, look at a first day of Silicon Valley and how you can, how people, people can help. Can't they? People can, can reach out to volunteer. Absolutely. We have, uh, volunteer information on our website, firsttsiliconvalley.org. And uh, we're looking for volunteers pretty much on a quarterly basis. There's kind of a ramp up to February 15th, May 15th, August 15th, and November 15th. Uh, if people want to coach and help with the kids, they, there's an onboarding process. But those are kind of the four deadlines for the seasons that are upcoming. Cool. And let me ask you, let me ask you one more question before, before we go, because I, you're a busy man and you've been generous for your time. Uh, do you see, do you think Tiger will ever win another tournament? Uh, yes. He, and he very well, he very well could win something like the Masters. So a shorter, a different course, especially one that he knows so well, I think it's possible. Uh, but I just love having him back part of the game. I was talking to a staff member earlier about who's younger, who was born when, in 97 when Tiger really came on the scene and won the Masters. And just saying how just, it was just, it's always different when he's playing because he's so good and just so, he's amazing. It still is. And I love, I love the guy and he's, he's been amazing for golf. I don't see him winning another major simply because I don't know if his body's ever going to hold up to that stress again. Right. The, the mental stress that goes along with the physical stress. And I think there's a part of me, and this is just me being selfish, that would love for him to Ted Williams it and just hit the homer and walk off. Mm -hmm. Right? Because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to see, I don't want to see Tiger as, and not to be, a, I, I'm not trying to throw anybody's name under the bus, but Hal Sutton or... Billy Mayfair, who are doing great on the senior tours, but just trying to hang on for the longest time. You just, you just don't want to, you want to see, we want to see our heroes just climb on the unicorn and go into the sunset. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be, when you love competition, it's got to be so hard to let go of it. When you look at Tom Brady, a chance to win again. Well, look at Tom Brady. And, and that's the thing. I, I, I was talking to Mike McGlinchey, the 49th, and he had this great, because I said, what makes Tom Brady keep going? And he goes, he is the greatest of all time at getting to the top of the mountain and staying there. Because I said, my, I, have, I have an attitude that he's the greatest quarterback of his era, right? He didn't, the, the game he played was not what Johnny Unitas played, which was one, uh, not what Joe Montana played, which was not what, you know, go forward ahead, you know. Uh, I, the, it, it changed so much. But he is the greatest of getting to the mountain and staying on top of the mountain. And that's truly, you can think of only, I can only think of three athletes. I can think of uh, Tom Brady, I can think of Michael Jordan, and I can think of Tiger Woods. 
And I don't think it's right to compare Tiger to Jack Nicklaus. Because again, it's just like you said, it's a different game. It's a different game with so much pressure, much more players and and all, all of this stuff. Tiger played a different game on different courses. The courses Jack and Arnie played, look at the Masters. You take a look at the Masters that Arnie won. Mm-hmm. It does not look like the Masters golf course we look at it as. Right. Right. There were grass growing in bunkers <laughs> on some of those. Old, they really were. They, you know, I was shocked by seeing the grass in the bunker. And there are no these clean edges. They weren't there. And the, the, the greens weren't. The greens looked like fairways. Right. I mean, they weren't the lightning fast. No. So it's, I, I completely agree with you on that. So, Interesting. <laughs> George, this has been such a delight, and you just have to promise me that we'll go, we'll golf nerd out again. I would love it. And then we should do some of this on the golf course, Gary. You tell me the time, and I'll be there with my cigar. I'll be ready to go. Where do you usually play? I play, I play all the mini courses. I used to be a member of the club, and then when everything changed, I became a, uh, I always told my wife, it's the first budget cut. It's the first budget cut. So now I'm a muni guy. So I go to anywhere. I love Santa Bar. I love Santa Teresa. I, I, I love all the courses that are just munis. And when my, and when my friends like Nate Deaton invite me to play their course, then by God, I go play that. <laughs> I'm a muni guy too. I take a muni over a private club any day. Good. We'll load up the cart and away we'll go. I can't wait to hear your stories. Sounds great. Gary, thank you so much.